Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to this segment in our study on the fifth trumpet. We're talking about the physical appearing of Lucifer as the Antichrist. I'm trying to lift your thoughts and your thinking to a whole new level in this great controversy that's been going on between Christ and Lucifer for thousands of years. So, at the moment, I'm going to assume that if you're watching this broadcast, that you understand that Lucifer was once in heaven. I, I'm going to, in our next month's broadcast, I'm going to examine Lucifer's uh, fall and more about him and how that he's called and identified through scripture uh, in, a, in, in ways that Protestants have distorted. Um, the Bible has a number of Bible texts that point to Lucifer and not to the Pope or not to this man that's going to be born in Europe or to Nero. So I want you to understand that at one time Lucifer was a covering cherub. That is, he stood on the left side of the throne of God. And Michael, the archangel, the other covering cherub, stood on the right. So Lucifer became jealous of Michael's higher position and honor standing on the right. Because Lucifer did not want the other angels to know that he was jealous of Michael, he began to undermine the authority and honor that was due Michael through lies and doubts. Lucifer came to exalt himself to think that he was equal to Michael in every way. This is how Lucifer became anti-Christ. Because Michael is the same member of the Godhead who lived in heaven and was born as Christ on earth. We could say that he's the original anti-Michael and the anti-Christ, meaning the same thing. Um, I've talked about this, the Trinity, in other seminar segments, so I'm not going to review that. All I'm saying is that Lucifer was eventually cast out of heaven along with one-third of heaven's angels. This is, uh, uh, this is alluded to, incidentally, uh, here in Revelation 12.4, where the scripture says, His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. This great red dragon in Revelation 12.4, his tail. I think it could be spelt T-A-L-E just as well. <laughs> sure, the great red dragon has a tail, but the idea is that he used his tail to deceive a third of the angels. I want you to look here at Lucifer's history. I want you to get an idea of what we're talking about. And so let's look at the 7,000 year picture. You see the number one on the screen here. This is where Lucifer was cast out of heaven for rebellion. I believe that after Lucifer was cast out of heaven, the earth was created, and then he came to earth, and he deceived Adam and Eve. And so then for 4,000 years, Lucifer is, you might say, the prince of earth. But then on Resurrection Sunday, Lucifer loses his seat, his chair, at the table in heaven's congress. He no longer can re represent the earth. Uh, we'll talk about this shortly. And so then for the past 2,000 years, Satan has been confined to the abyss or the spirit realm, cannot leave earth. He is locked in the abyss, and this is where, in the fifth trumpet, we're going to find that he is released from the abyss. So here he's cast out of heaven at before the world is created. 4,000 years goes by. He's cast out of heaven again at Resurrection Sunday. 2,000 years go by, and now he's released from the abyss, and he will come up out of the abyss with his angels, 200 million of them, and um, he will do his dirty work, if you will, for the last 445 days of earth's history. And then at the second coming, uh, he will be returned to the abyss where he will remain uh, in prison for 1,000 years with no one to tempt because everyone is dead 
All the wicked are dead and all the righteous are with Jesus in the holy city, New Jerusalem. At the end of the thousand years, the holy city descends. Lucifer is released to tempt the nations because the wicked will be resurrected. And he, and he leads the wicked in a charge against the holy city and he's destroyed. So this is a 7,000 year view starting with his casting out of heaven. Um, pro approximately 7,000 years of Lucifer's history. I hope that makes sense to you. Because chronological order is a very important rule in apocalyptic prophecy, I'm going to go over Revelation 12, where the birth of Jesus occurs, so that I can show you how the fifth trumpet unfolds in Revelation 9. All right, let's go to Revelation 12. 12 1. We're reading here from Scripture. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman, a woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Now John just sees a snapshot of this woman that is pregnant. She's clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, and has a crown, a Stephanos, a crown of victory of 12 stars on her head. Verse 2, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon. And notice the anatomy of this dragon. He has seven heads and ten horns, and there are seven crowns on his heads. Seven diadema. Now the woman is wearing a Stephanos crown. The dragon is wearing a diadema crown. Two different types of crowns. 12 verse 4. His tail, that is the great red dragon, swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. This sentence is referring to the fact that Lucifer led a third of the angels in rebellion and they were cast out of heaven. Okay. So the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he could devour her child the moment it was born. All right, this is giving us some timing clues about this cosmic vision. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Okay? And after the child is snatched up to God in his throne, the woman fled to the, into the desert to a place prepared for her by God. A place prepared for her where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. All right. Four establishing points of reference are found in this prophecy. First, the woman represents the people of God. This cosmic woman standing on the moon, wearing the sun, the righteousness of Christ, represents the people of God. And her presence in Revelation is contrasted by the other woman in Revelation, the great whore, who represents the wicked who will live at the end of the age, during the Great Tribulation. So Revelation has a story of two women. One, the people of God, the great whore, the people of Lucifer. Number two, here's the second establishing point. The great red dragon with the seven heads and ten horns represents the devil, and the Bible clearly says so. We'll see that in a moment. And, of course, the male child is Jesus, who will rule all nations with a rod of iron, unbroken rule, and he was snatched up to God's throne where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And then the Bible says the dragon chased the woman to the desert for 1260 days. And this is a parallel reference to the time, times, and half a time mentioned in Daniel 7. This 1260 days has to be translated as 1260 years because the Jubilee calendar is operating. So the dragon chases the woman to a place prepared for her. God has not forgotten the woman. God has not forgotten his people. 
And we know how the devil uses the Christian church to persecute Christians. What better persecuting, uh, what better form of persecution than using Christians to persecute Christians? It's interesting to me how that in history, the persecuted always becomes the persecutor. It's just a fascinating point, isn't it? How what goes round comes round. So we have four establishing points that have been laid out here in Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6. 12, 1 through 6 is a prophecy all in its own right. So here's the timeline that 12, 1 through 6 brings us. The dragon is standing in front of the woman to devour her child the moment it's born. Jesus is born in 4 B.C., right before King Herod dies. And then we know Jesus ascended in A.D. 30. He returned to heaven. And then we know that the dragon chases the woman for 1260 years and this came to an end in 1798. So this would mean that the chasing began in 538, 1260 years earlier. So this is the chrono chronological order of Revelation 12, 1 through 6, a complete prophecy within its own right. Now that the timeline in verses 1 through 6 has been established, and you remember perhaps that rule 1 requires that timelines be laid out because every event occurs in its order within each prophecy. Every event is either date stamped or chronologically located. So with this said, we continue to the next prophecy in Revelation because it builds upon the timeline that's laid out in the first six verses. The next prophecy begins with Revelation 12, 7. All right, watch this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought back. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a voice, a loud voice in heaven say, Now, present tense, now have come the salvation the power, the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God, day and night, has been hurled down. Revelation 12, 11. They, that is our brothers, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, verse 12 you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, time and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Well, there's a lot to be said about Revelation 12 and I don't want to digress there for now. Um, I want to stay on, on track here with this thing about Lucifer. And I want to focus on this key question. When did this war in Revelation 12, 7 between the dragon and Michael occur? Many Christians think this war refers to the original conflict between Lucifer and Michael, but this is not the case. The war in Revelation 12, 7 occurred on Resurrection Sunday. Watch how this unfolds. Revelation 12, 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. And when the dragon, verse 13, saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman 
what? What's it say? He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. In other words, the dragon is cast out of heaven after the woman gave birth. So it would, this war has to happen after 4 BC. This, this war has to occur after Jesus is born. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. In other words, this casting out of heaven has to occur after the male child is born. But wait, there's more. Look at these verses. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. In other words, the authority of Christ occurs after Jesus goes to heaven on that Sunday morning and his sacrifice is accepted by the Father. And this is why the loud voice in heaven says, after Satan is kicked out, now, present tense, at this moment in time, have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Now, if this war in Revelation 12, 7 occurred before the creation of the world, as some Christians think, how could Satan be called the accuser of our brothers when there weren't any human beings to accuse before the world is created? But wait, there's more. <laughs> Look at the words of Jesus. John 12, 26, Jesus said, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this world, to this hour. This is right before the crucifixion of Christ. He's at the temple, and he is talking to his, uh, those that are around him saying, I came to die. I came to pay the price. And should I be praying, Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. John 12, 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. John 12, 29, the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. And then look what he says in verse 31. Now, present tense, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, not of earth, but of heaven. See, the death of Jesus on Calvary made atonement for sinners completely paid for. And so there's no accusations that Lucifer can make now because Jesus has lived the perfect life. He pays the perfect price with his life by death. And so now the judgment, the judgment for this world as a condemned world stands complete. And Lucifer, the prince of this world, will be driven out of heaven because he has no standing in heaven's congress as a representative of earth. Look again at this verse. I want you to see it. Jesus said just before he went to the cross, now is the time for the prince of this world to be driven out. Out of where? Well, out of heaven. And that's why there is war in heaven. Jesus hurried to heaven on resurrection morning, and this is why he told Mary not to hold on to him. He returned to the Father to take Lucifer's seat in heaven's Congress. As the prince of this world, Lucifer had represented earth for 4,000 years. 
But Jesus, on the basis of his sinless life and shed blood, declared that he had earned the right to represent the world. And the Father agreed with Jesus. Lucifer and Michael Jesus. I mean, I use the term Michael Jesus to represent the same person. He's Jesus to us. He's Michael to the angels. Lucifer and Michael Jesus fought over this position and Lucifer was humiliated, defeated, and forever cast out of heaven. No longer could he serve as earth's representative as he did in Job 1. You can go to Job 1 and read how the devil attended these meetings. What does this have to do with the fifth trumpet? Well, quite a bit actually. John saw the cosmic battle between Jesus and the dragon, Lucifer, devil, Satan. He saw, I'm going to read here from King James Version, Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that serpent, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. The little preposition, Greek preposition here, um, into, is important. He saw him cast into the earth, like you would throw a rock into the pond and his angels were cast out with him. The devil and his angels were cast into the earth. In other words, like a stone thrown into a lake, the devil and his angels sank out of sight into the spirit realm after they were cast into the earth. These demons have been confined in the abyss, which is a nondescript place. The abyss is a Greek term, abusos, meaning a nondescript place that you can't see. The demons have been confined in the abyss ever since Resurrection Sunday. And at the fifth trumpet, the abyss will be unlocked, and the devil and a large number of his angels will pop out. Think of it as Lucifer in the box, instead of Jack in the box. <laughs> John saw this happen. And later on in Revelation 17, an angel spoke to John about this. Notice the words that the angel spoke. He's telling John about some things that are going to transpire. And the angel says, look, John, the beast, the great red dragon, which you saw, once was visible. But now he's been cast out of heaven and he is inside the earth. He's in the abyss. He is now is not visible. But he will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. Now get this sentence. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, when they see the dragon, the lamb-like beast, as the case will be, because he once was visible, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and be visible. All right, so what does the Bible teach here? I want to, let's see, let's put this on the next page. And I want you to look at how this little scenario works. Here is where Jesus is born. The devil is there attempting to devour the man-child through Herod the moment Jesus is born. 4 BC. Then on Resurrection Sunday in AD 30, Lucifer is cast out of heaven and he's cast into the earth. Okay? And then we know that he chases the woman for 1260 years for, to a place prepared for her in the desert by God. A time, times, and half a time. So the, he uses the Christian church, the Roman Catholic church, to persecute uh, those who disagree. Christians who disagree with its theology. So, looking at Revelation uh, 12, we find that here he is, cast into the earth on Resurrection Sunday, and he's been out of sight in the abyss ever since, and at the fifth trumpet, he pops up. He comes out of the earth, out of the abyss. And so the fifth trumpet is going to be coming soon. I want you to look at this picture for a moment, this little chart. Here are the first four trumpets, okay? Seven trumpets, here's the first four. And uh, then we wait for 
the, the 890th day, and we have the fifth trumpet, which is the physical appearing of the devil. And the third angel's message goes with the physical appearing of the devil. And if any man worship the beast and receive his mark, the same will receive the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. So there's three angels' messages here. As Babylon forms, the second angel's message is given. And of course, as the great tribulation begins and these judgments are seen, the first angel's message, worship the creator Jesus Christ, the judgment of the living has become. This is the living of the, this is the judgment of the living. So I want you just to see the timing for the fifth trumpet is. And the fifth trumpet and the fifth seal are related and here's the martyrdom that's coming. And there will be a fourth angel's message which says, come out of Babylon or you're going to get to seven, you're going to participate in God's wrath, the seven bowls. So I want you to just to see how all of these pieces wonderfully connect and bring the story into very sharp focus. All right. We only have a short time left in this seminar segment, but I want to read the scripture and make a little commentary as we go along. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, Revelation 9.1, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth, and the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. This star is not a rock. This star is like one of the seven stars that were in Jesus' hand. Remember back in Revelation 1, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And this star was once a glorious star in heaven. It was the bright star, the brightest of the created beings. And to him was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. The smoke was so great, John says, the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. When Lucifer appears, his presence will be so huge on a local basis that it will darken the sun and the sky. And notice the origin of these of Satan's appearing, and out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth. Came down upon the earth, meaning they descend from the sky, and they were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree. In other words, they cannot harm any food, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Well, we're out of time for this segment, but I'll close with this, with this um, very important um, concept. When Satan comes, the saints will know who he is. The religious wicked will believe that he's God, and the non-religious wicked will be not sure what to do or what to think. Because his physical presence and his glorious appearing with 200 million demons will overwhelm any logic they may have had to justify that there is no God. So the devil cannot harm the saints because they have the seal of God on their foreheads. The devil's not going to harm those who believe that he's God, so he's going to only torment the non-religious wicked. Well, I'll have a lot more to say about this in our next segment. We'll see you next month. May God be with you. Study hard. Read Revelation 9 in its entirety. Be prepared for our next study. May God bless you, is my prayer.